So the idea is to, to identify elements of the set of associators or elements of the growth and dictation of group as uh, some series satisfying some equations. So that's the definition which were given by Griffith originally appears as just consequences of this more abstract definition if you want. And to do this, uh, I need a somehow a theorem which uh, which basically gives you a kind of universal property for PAB. So the idea is that if you have a, a, a presentation of PAB somehow by generators in relation, what you're gonna say is that if you have such an isomorphism, just tell where the generators are sent by the isomorphism and which relation we should satisfy it and hopefully we will end up with the same equation that we thought uh, gave the microphone of the all right, uh, and, and the idea of the Rinfeld was really based on, on some dosage by a project that there's this, what people call the, I don't know, what we call the notation of tower, which is the tower of modernized space of curves in genus zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is pretty much related to configuration space. Uh, and the idea that the whole tower, I mean, it's, it's geometry is somehow completely generated by what happened uh, in, in low areas. And that's exactly what the theorem I'm about to state is saying. So here's a, a way to phrase this. So as an opera in groupoids, having PA as opera of objects, uh, PAB generated by uh, two elements, something that, that I call R, and that sometimes I will write just R12, just to remember uh, Okay, so that's a, that's an element, if you wish, in on P A B two one two two one. So that's one of the generators, and the other generator is phi, which sometimes you may want to write just phi one two three to remember that it acts uh, on strands which are in this order. Um, and this one is something that we already wrote. And so that's that's a morphism in P A B three from one to three with the less leftmost parentization to one to three to the rightmost one. Okay. Uh, so it has generators and satisfying. Uh, so, so some relations. So the relations are first of all. So there's a bunch of relations that are quite obvious. So if you apply phi to the like to strands which are in a different order, like uh, in kind of the opposite one, what you get is phi inverse. And you can really check that these two of them live in the in the same space. Well, basically. Uh, there's a second condition uh, which says that if you remove one of the strands in phi, you get the identity. That's that's pretty much visible here. So when you do phi empty one two, this is phi one empty two, this is phi one two empty. And this is the identity of the object one. Okay, so when I when I put an empty in a spot, it just means this operation that removes uh, some strands, and that's a purely operatic operation that's composing with the unique uh, zero array operation um, 
uh, of like on the the, the specific strand you you chose. All right, so these these relations are not the most interesting ones. Now there is a this relation which is the tech one. So there's R one two five two one three R one three, which is equal to five one three R one two three and um, five two three one. So that's something that lives in Tom in G A B three from uh, one, two, three, with this parentheses to um, two, two, one, three, one. I'm sorry, I, I realized that I probably, yeah, that's something I, I often do. Like in group waves, I write the composition not as composition like in, when you compose functions, but I just write sequentially arrows. So that's my convention. I'm sorry about that if you're used to the other convention. All right. Uh, so just to, to explain one piece of notation. So I think everything is, is pretty clear from what I said before, except maybe that guy here. So that guy, is, I mean, pictorially, you can depict it in the following way. That's just, you have this here. That's this, this grade. And that's really, again, it is purely operatively defined. You pick R and you, you plug in uh, the identity of some of some of, uh, of, of uh, the object let's say one two in the second spot okay so you can write it really as a partial composition of r and an identity of two of two strands all right uh, there's the exact same equation but now with uh, R tilde, so you just replace R with R tilde, and R tilde is just the braiding that goes the other way around, so that's R21 inverse, and that's, if you look at what it is, it's the other braid. And finally, there's the pentagon equation that you can write like this, so, so we will this at least once already. And that's an equation that holds in on in PAB4. Uh, from one, two, three, four, with the leftmost parentheses to the same guy, but with the right one. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to prove this uh, this theorem. Exercise. So uh, no, not <laughs> exercise would be really mean. Uh, so like, you can definitely. Uh, deduce the proof from uh, Junfeld's original paper. If you want a, a first proof but a, of something a bit different, it's not phrased in terms of operat, but uh, uh, but uh, there's a there's a proof by Barnaton, which is in another language, which essentially says this. And if you really want a proof that uses the word operat, and that that's that's in the book of Junfeld. And like the way I phrase things is a bit an average way between what Barnaton does and what Fress does. Because Benoit used a lot, uh, like he probably uses more operatic notation. So he doesn't use much of this like one, two, et cetera. He really uses the, the, the partial composition. Uh, it's just that I'm oriented toward this. I was educated with this, uh, this nice superscript <laughs> and I love them.
All right, so now let's see a bunch of consequences of, of, of this uh, Brenner's theorem. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yes? I want to understand um, the meaning of R field here. So it's not a relation. Are you just introducing notation? Yeah, so R tilde is defined to be this. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that there's an additional relation. Which is, which is the same as the one before, but you just replace R with R tilde. It's just that in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in red monolithic categories, there are two hexagons, and these are the two hexagons one for the overcrossing and, and the other one for the undercrossing. Yes? I have a question. P321 does it start from uh, something different from P123? Yeah, so if, if you have an operation, that acts like, like that is in PAD3. Because we have an operand, you can act by a permutation. It gives you another operation, right? So this phi, this phi 3, 2, 1, that's just the image of phi 1, 2, 3 by the permutation that sends 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 2, and 1, 2, 3. So like, if you want to write it, um, it's phi 3, 2, 1. That's going to be the same picture, but just you rename indices. So that's this guy. Okay. Uh, okay so you are just on the label on the top. Yeah, you just permit the labels. And then this relation essentially tells you that this guy here, it is exactly reading this guy from bottom to top. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it's no. Hmm. I realize that it's, um, it is not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, I, I, I'm completely sorry. Like the expansion for what five three two one is is correct, but uh, yeah, I think I yeah let's. Delete this relation from that, that comes in in another place. I'm sorry about this. Uh, because phi 3 to 1 and phi 1 to 3 inverse, they don't live in the same set. So, like, forget about it. And by the way, thank you for the question. All right. Uh, so, there's a nice consequence of this. Is that uh, there's uh, one, one correspondence. Between uh, associators. Okay. And series. I K X one. No, oh, sorry. With pairs. Lambda phi. Where lambda is an invertible element in K, and phi is a series in two variable. That well, uh, so we have several. Well, let me rewrite the relation that I wrote before. So, five is a group like elements. Uh, five y x is just the inverse series. Um, then there's the the, the 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 hexagon equation, so that there's five, one, two, three. Um, actually, okay. Exponential lambda t two three over two five uh, two three one exponential lambda t one three over two five. Uh, 312 exponential lambda over 2, and this should be exponential lambda times t 
That's the hexagon equation. And uh, here we call that phi, let's say one, two, three, is just phi. So phi is a series in two variables that you apply to t12, t23. And then phi, whatever permutation you apply, is just you permit in this in this in this definition. Right? So that's the hexagon equation. And there's only one hexagon in this case. And then there's the pentagon, which is, uh, yeah, it's the same. So that's fine. One, two, three, four. So it looks like the, the same equation, but here it's an equation that leaves. So this this equation here lives in x of t three, and this equation here lives in x of t four. And uh, again, this the meaning of this one two etc. Here that's the insertion product. So that's the operat that that comes from the operatic structure. On the operator of call diagrams, on the on the operator of keys. All right. So I just want to make a, a bunch of remarks. First of all, it looks like, apart from some fatalities, these are like completely the same equations. It's not quite for several reasons. So even this, even the pentagon, it's it, it's exactly the same equation, but the meaning is a bit different. On the right here. What we when we multiply here, it's really composing things. On the left here, uh, this is just multiplication in this group here, the product. Uh, and then uh, there is this R, which becomes this exponential lambda something. All right. Sorry, I yes. The meaning of the T hat. Oh, it's again you take degree completion. So this is this. Uh, I, yeah, just let's avoid this. It's in U T four, but it's between group-like elements in this complete uh, universal homology algebra. Again, the T n are algebra with a grading, and we take the completion of the universal homology algebra with respect to that the filtration associated to that grading. Um. Right, so uh, yeah, there's a there's one remark I want to make is that this equation may seem a bit different from what you can read in the literature. Actually, the, the hexagon is often written differently in many papers. So So let me choose variable x being t12, y being t23, and z being t13. And uh, but uh, so let me mention that t12 plus t23 plus t13 is it, it generates the center of the algebra t3. So the way people write the, the hexagon equation usually is they, they assume that x plus y plus z is equal to zero. So namely <coughs> what they work, what they do is rework in the quotient of t3 by its center. And then they write the equation in the following way, which is a bit more uh, compact than what I wrote. Uh, they write phi x y times exponential lambda y over two phi 
y z exponential lambda z over two phi uh, z x exponential lambda x over two equal uh, sorry one okay and that that takes place in uh, you can see the freely algebra like it in the free uh, associative algebra generated by x and y and you just declare that z is minus x minus y okay it's just the same equation as before but when you have quotient is by the center and you can prove that so it seems like a weaker thing thing to add because like on the left, not only that you have a, a, a something being central, but it should be of a specific form. But the other equation imposes that it has to be of this form. So in the end, uh, it's equivalent to require this equation or this one once you have the others. All right. Uh, let me give an idea of the proof of the consequence. So Sorry. On se pose la question de quand est-ce qu'on switch sur l'autre caméra. Et je préfère laisser le tableau où tu as écrit les choses pour les gens qui n'ont. Yeah, so the, yeah, the, the consequence should really be stated as a theorem and a theorem telling you that associators defined in an operative way are in bijective correspondence with associators defined according to the original definition. Uh, so like the idea of the proof is like one way is as well. So pick some F, uh, which is an isomorphism between P, A, and K, and uh, uh, that is uh, the identity objects. And uh, well, such a, uh, such a thing is completely determined by the image of R. And R should be uh, an element in. Uh, but it should be a morphism in a root two that goes from one two to two one. And if you remember how we have like what it is here, these are called diagrams and with permutations. So you have no choice but like because R switches one and two, so you have no choice to have these elements X, which was the the permutation between one and two, multiplied by some core diagram. And the core diagram in like RT2, there's not much choice. They're just, and it should be group like moreover. So you have no choice but this being exponential something times T12. And I, I just choose by convention to write it that way for lambda some parameter. It like is the only thing you can write. And uh, if you look at the image of phi, again, it has to go from the leftmost parentization to the rightmost one. So it must be some core diagram uh, multi somehow multiplied with this thing here. And uh, yeah, there's a bit of work, but you can prove that it can be something of that form. And then what you do is you pick the defining, the defining relation for PAB and you check what they give for these two elements. And they give you exactly, and it's not very surprising, this equation there. Okay. 
And I mean, the other way around, uh, anytime you have something defining, I mean, satisfying this equation, you define f of r and f of phi being exactly this, and it satisfies the relation. So it defines a morphism. Uh, uh, morph. So it defines a morphism, I, I should say. And if lambda is zero, it's not an isomorphism, but, uh, but actually to get an isomorphism, you need lambda to be interpreted. All right. Yeah, you want to argue the case where the sum of the three terms is zero. The sum of the three T1, two, T1, three, T1, two, T1, three, and T1, two. So that's, that's, that's the main point here. There is a bit of work to prove that you can always write phi this way. So a priori here, you should have some elements in a U of T3. Which is group like, but it, it, it's something that is expressed in terms of T12, T23, and T13. And that, that's, that's where there's a, like a, slice, a slight subtlety in the proof that you can actually prove that you can uh, have something of this from here. All right. Uh, there's a serial story for GT, so the gradient indication of group. Let me. So, well, it's similar, right? Elements of GT at A are interjection pairs. Uh, what's a lambda F? Uh, where lambda is uh, an invertible argument from K and F is an element of the K pre-inhibiting completion of the free group in two variables with two generators, uh, satisfying. Um, so, yeah, so let, let me write X and Y again for the two generators of the free group. Yeah, I'm sorry because this, yeah, I, I try to write F capital X capital Y for group elements. Uh, this is F Y X inverse. Um, so that's the first condition. The second condition looks very much like the uh, the, the hexagon, it's x1 to some like new, I'll explain what it is, f x1, oh, right, x1, sorry. so f x1, f y d, and d, the new, This should be one in a group generated by three elements x, y, z, where the product of x, y, and z should be one. And uh, new is uh, lambda minus one over two. And I will explain in a moment why there is this weird thing here. And finally, there is an analog of the of the of the pentagon equation, which is a bit more complicated to write. So let me write the formula and then explain what it means. So we have f of like x13, x23, x of x12, x23, x24. You need to go to f of x12, x23, f of x12, x13, x23, x24, f of okay. So 
that's an equation that lives in the pure break group with four strengths and like k for any position of physics. And uh, here, let me write what xij means. xij is a pure break. So we have like a number of strengths. And the, So that's the i one, there's so here, that's the j one. So that's this pure break. So that's the i strand going over the j one and passing under all the intermediate ones. Okay? I'm sorry, where we in the three group to so on that? Sorry? What's the relationship between say if x one, three, and big X and big one. Big so, like the, the point is that whenever you have an element in the free group, mm -hmm. you can substitute any element of another group. So you have like the free group in, in like that's a, that's an element in the free group in two general pairs. You can in any pick any other group and pick any two elements. You can okay. substitute them, and that gives you an element of that group. Okay. That's what we're writing here. Okay. And secretly, you should think of this f of x y as actually living in the in the pure grade group on three elements modeled out by its center. Okay, and that's the free group into generators. That's the same game as before. Okay, all right. Um, so here again, that's that's actually another way of, of, of seeing this is again looking at things in the pure grade group in uh, on three strands modeled out by the center. So somehow this guy is x12, this guy is x23, and this guy is the inverse of the other. All right, are there other questions? So let me explain again, like it's, it's very similar in spirit. Uh, like proving this is very similar in spirit to, to the proofs that associators were in bijection with uh, with uh, with drill, the way drill bot defined them. Uh, here, I'd like to explain essentially one thing is the appearance of, of this lambda minus one over two, uh, because it may seem surprising. All right, so um, again, so maybe like this is why my man is my two. So you want to describe uh, an automorphism of PAB using uh, like this kind of element. So again, we pick some f come from PAB to itself, which is an automorphism that is the uh, that is the identity of objects. So first of all, you should give the image of R, which is let me draw pictures, he said. But there's not much choice. It should be a bunch of, uh, like it should be something that, that breaks two strands and that in the end switches one and two, right? So it can only be uh, like something of that sort. Where here you have like um, how many? Um, uh, 
you have to have an odd number of crossings if you want things to be switched, right? That's just what, it, what it's saying. Of course, if uh, new can be negative here, it just means that you have under crossings instead of proper crossing. But you, it cannot alternate because if you have an under crossing and then an over crossing, they just cancel each other because they are inverse to each other. Sorry? Yeah, the picture is not good, but you guys. Why the picture is not Oh, yes, that is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, so essentially, and yeah, I should say that if you work in the pro unit with completion, uh, there's some work to do, but, but this new may be a, like not an integer, but now a, 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 um, just a number in K. Right? That, that's a bit counterintuitive, but, uh, but it's just that an expression like in the pre unit with completion, an expression like x to the power lambda, where lambda is, uh, is an element of k, it, it makes perfect sense. OK? And then, uh, like, again, f of this guy here, well, so there are two ways, like, there are two ways of, of seeing this. Um, um, so, it should be an element that goes from like one, two, three with the leftmost parentization to one, two, three with the rightmost one. And uh, you can, whenever you have a group weight, the set of isomorphism between two elements, it's non canonically isomorphic to the automorphic group of one of these. But there is a, but the, the, this isomorphism is like any choice of. Of, a, of the narrow between these two elements gives you such an isomorphism. So it's not canonical, but in the set of morphism from one, two, three to one, two, three, we do have a kind of distinguished one, which is this one, which means that you can write any element uh, in this isomorphism set as something times this guy. So here, we can rewrite this as something times this guy, or I should rewrite like times is like pretty composing arrows. And this something lives in the automorphism group of the guy upstairs, but that, that group is isomorphic to the pure grade groups on three strands. So this element here lives in the pure grade group of, of on, on, on three strands. And again, there's a bit of work, but you can prove that you can write it as f of x12, x23, just as in the associator case. And then you just remember the series, like you call this x and you call this y, and that gives you your f. Right? So then the, the next thing to do is to you can ask yourself, well, what is the, so now I, I, I have a, an element of group and they're in bijection with a certain pairs of a number and, a, and, a, and an F. So what's the, the group multiplication in GT when GT is described uh, by pairs of element lambda F? So what you have to do is trace back all, I mean, the identification and you write, you pick two elements, so you pick your, lamb, your, your lambda, which is two nu plus one, and you pick your, your f here. It defines, it defines your metamorphism, and you write the composition explicitly, and just look at what it does on these elements. And so that's, a, it's just computation. And I, I'm just about to give you the answer, not, not doing the computation. So uh, the group structure, Uh, so you have lambda one f one. You multiply it with lambda two f two, and by multiplication, that's really like the composition of automorphisms. And what you get, well, on numbers it's not complicated; it's just the product of them. And then for the series, 
it's a bit more complicated. So you pick the first series and you plug in X, yeah, I should write capital X to the lambda two on the first variable and on the second variable, that's F2 of X1, Y to the lambda two and F2 of Yx, which is F2 of F, F, X, Y inverse. Um, yeah, and then, oh, let's, let's process this and you multiply with F2 of X, Y. So here X and Y are two generators of the free group. Yeah, so I should say that this is, this multiplication, so like, that, that's an element of the free group, and I, I write it in an equational way. I'm applying it to a two element X and Y. So these are exactly the two generators of the free group in two generators. Okay, that, so that's a bit of a complicated formula, but it, like, it looks really like you're composing something, and actually that's, that's exactly what happens. Uh, yes. Uh, and there's a similar formula for GT acting on associators. So the action on associators gets a similar formula. So let me get it for you. Uh, there's so lambda f, let's say acts on mu phi. And so that should give uh, that should give an associator. So we have a number, which is again lambda times mu, and then we have f apply. So now this should give an associator. So the second term should be an element, which is a series in two variables, little x and little y, right? So we're not working in the in the free group. We're rather working in the exponential of 3D algebra. I mean, there are some more people, but I'm, I, I'm making points, making a bit of a difference between them. Um, yeah, if you know about the cache bar band problem, mm -hmm. you may understand why. Uh, so you have apply f to exponential mu x, then phi x y, then exponential mu y, and then phi y x, which is phi x y inverse. And then that is f, and then we multiply with phi y x, x y sorry. That's, so that's the formula. So, I mean, I think this is illustrates somehow that what, I, what I said in the very beginning, that's why the operatic approach is kind of satisfying because like with the operatic approach, you have like a, like you have automorphism group isomorphisms, like the group structure and the, and the, and the action on, on associators. I mean, it comes just by definition. Well, when you wanna, like in the original papers, like you cannot guess the formula, you write them, and then you have to prove that they are indeed, like they define a group structure uh, and, 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 and an action. You have a lot of things to, to, to check. Like the approach with operator is telling you that all this is satisfied, but then there's some work to prove I mean, to give uh, 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 an explicit expression of, of, of the action and of the group structure. All right. Um, before moving to uh, like the cyclotomic case, there is a, a bunch of things I want to say about the topological approach to PAB, which is something we talked about like yesterday. So it's not. It's actually not completely necessary for the whole story, but I think it's uh, it's enlightening to understand the uh, to understand it somehow. Let me know if there are questions online. Oui, mais non. Oui, oui, t'inquiète. Yeah, okay. Je... ouais. you... just... Yes. Just... <laughs> I, <'aimerais> bien. <laughs> I, I have a question. It seems to be okay online, right? Uh, so now I want to give a, a topological description. Of 
PAD. Oops, sorry. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, there is a similar story for GRT, so the graded Grotten Dictation Group. It is a bit more complicated because uh, GRT does not have a presentation by, uh, because PACD does not have a presentation by generators and relations. Though you can prove that it satisfies some universal property, like the universal property is pretty long to write, uh, especially because you have like the X and the H are kind of group like elements. Uh, no, the X and the A, so the, 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 the symmetry like uh, switching two guys and the associators, they are group like elements, but the H, which is the, the, the port, uh, this is a lead, this is rather a primitive element. So it's a, you cannot write it, there's no real presentation by generated in relations. Still, uh, so it's written in the book of Von Bonafest. You have um, a universal property, and from this universal property, you can explicitly describe the, the automorphism group of, of uh, PATD. And get and get back the, the explicit formula that uh, that Brinkman has in his paper, and the explicit formula is very much similar to the one for GT, except that like a bunch of things are linearized, and it's I mean some formula are even easier to write. All right, so um, moving on to topological description of PAD, I first want to start with a. Uh, uh, Warm up with a description of the opera PA. Uh, it may sound a bit dumb, but uh, you'll see that it's it's interesting. It's, it's probably something that you really know. So let me consider uh, the consideration space of. On R indexed by some uh, finite set I. So, by definition, that's just a collection of points indexed by I, which are pairwise disjoints. So, I is just a finite set. Okay. Um, R to the cardinality. It's R to the I, so that's just map from I to R. It, it's isomorphic to R to the community of I. Damien, I'm sorry, there is a question on, on the chat. Yes. About the last formula of last board, where did X come from? Last formula of last board. This one here? Uh, I, I, I imagine. Yeah, so. so so this lambda f is an element of the Grotten dictation group. This mu phi is an associator. And we make an element of the Grotten dictation group act on an associator. I should get an element, I should get an associator. So I'm describing an associator. An associator is a pair, a number in a series in two variables. So this lambda mu is the number, and this is a series in two variables, and the x and y are the two variables. It's just that maybe. It can be more naming, but uh, this phi here is phi of little x, little y, and this f here is f of x, of big x and big y. Does it answer the question? I hope so. Just, uh, does it answer your question? Yeah, yes, it does. Both where? the two. Okay. Yes, it does. Do not ask a question again. Yeah, the two formula. It's two formulae are All very right, so. Um, so here we have this configuration space. Uh, it has a bunch of symmetries, namely, we don't want to care so much if we have the same configuration translated or divided. So we define CRI to be the same time with metadata by translations and dilatations. Uh, and that's a, uh, it's actually a, a, a manifold. It has dimension 
probability of i minus two. That is, of course, if i is at, has at least two elements. Otherwise, it's just like that for 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 i being having element zero one, it's just we consider this being just the points. Okay. Uh, then we can apply the axiomal tinker or tinker for the math or rather I think it's the real version of the quantification to get uh, some space C bar R. I don't want to get into this this uh, like uh, this compactification process. Essentially, when you have points that come close to each other, it's something that remembers how fast they come close to each other, basically. And it adds, like, if you remember the speed, uh, it gives you uh, additional points when at infinity, and uh, and it provides a compactification. One way to, to describe it is by applying successive real law up on the diagonal. But uh, yeah, I don't want to get into this. Instead, um, instead of this, first of all, let me say that, uh, like, I'm going to describe now the boundary of this space, which is just uh, the space minus the open cell. All right, and um, so this boundary, it's a union. It's not a disjoint union, but it's a union uh, over all partitions like I as a disjoint union J1, uh, Jn, I don't know, of like some irreducible components, uh, so we have D, J1, Jn, I. And uh, the, the fun part is that the, these boundary components are exactly isomorphic to products of configuration spaces of the exact same type. Uh, so you get the products for I going to one, from one to N, of configurations of Ji points on R, and then that gets a product with the conversion space of, of n points. And like, if you want a, a picture uh, to understand this, so we have a certain number of points on the line. This right. And the compactification is telling you like what happens when like these points, this group of points come close together. So if, let's say we have like those points indexed by J1, and then that's J2, and that's Jn. So for each group of points, you have a copy of the compactified configuration space, but then you have also a copy of the configuration space, which tells you how the groups are uh, in the configuration of the group themselves. So like if you zoom out, these these uh, these like blobs they become like from far away you see them as points and it gives you an additional configuration which corresponds to this factor here. And uh, the fun part is that it really describes an opera. So uh, basically the inclusion of these boundary components it's exactly the operatic composition. So this makes uh, like if you really want to describe the let's say the partial composition, uh, that would correspond to
have your all, I mean, all GIs, but one uh, uh, being singletons, so being just a single element. Indeed, I think you write on the line. Uh, that would be this kind of configurations. That the uh, circle I composition is given by the boundary, the inclusion of the boundary components that corresponds to this thing here. Okay. All right. So. Um, so now this operator has a nice sub operator. So it's an operator in topological spaces. Uh, I should even say that the, this, this integration spaces are stratified. Even better, they are manifold with corners. And so you can look at the maximal codimension strata. Yeah, probably I should. Yeah, there's something I should really say. Is that uh, these things are just static points? New statement. So this is something many of you actually know very well. Um, and so there are like, if you know about static points, you can see that they have like nice replication. Uh, and the maximal so. Maximal co-dimension strata, namely strata of dimension zero, namely vertices of such polytops, uh, form a sub opera. Well, of uh, that is. Canonically isomorphic to PA. Namely, so the maximal co dimension things are nested uh, like blobs of configurations where uh, you never allow anyone to have a group of points which is bigger than two. So, like, I don't know, that's too many points here. Uh, so let's say you have this typically. And if you want to write it in terms of uh, parentheses, uh, that would be, well, this one should be labeled by a set. So let's label them by one, two, three, four. So let's say we have two, one, three, and four here. Like, if you really need to talk PV, that's just two, one, three, four. And then that's this parentheses. Right. Yes, there's a question. No, it's just to understand the, to see if I understand correctly. So in this case, since everything is parenthesized. So but I mean, don't, don't you have a okay? So you're taking relations and translations, so it kind of always looks like two points at yes, so anywhere it, in the line for each of the zooms. The, right. the essential thing is that because we modulate by translation and dilation, the configuration space of two points is just one is just uh, just one point, right? Like by translation you can put the first one at zero and by dilation the second at one. So like there's only one pass. Yeah. So that's why here what you get really here is going to be a product of configuration space of two points, which are just it's a product point, so it's a point. There's only one. Sure. Uh, yeah, I should I should mention some sort of here. This guy here, it's not a single stash of polytop. It's a disjunct union, and the number of you have is exactly the number of uh, of uh, uh, of commutation of uh, the your finite set prime. For every order you choose on I, you have one copy of the stash of polytop of dimension uh, carnality of I minus two. Because it's a symmetric operator and not the non symmetric operator. It, because it's the symmetric operator and not the non symmetric one, exactly. Yes. Um, all right. So, 
So what we can do now, we have a, a sub operand in an operand, and uh, this operand is a top operand. So what I can do is take the sum of the throughput of this based as elements in the sub operand here. So I'm going to consider the homotopy classes of paths inside the configuration space, which are based at the maximal co-dimension um, stratum. Um, right, so that's well, the functor from the group where it's a symmetric model functor, so it's an operat to operat. So that is an operating group wave. And I claim that. Uh, There is a morphism of operating group weights from PAB to that guy. And it's uh, fairly simple to write because PAB has a presentation by generator from reductions. So I just need to tell you where R and phi are sent to. And well, uh, remember that R is this uh, overcrossing break here. Uh, you just send it to the Uh, to the path that will switch these two elements here. And if you want, if, if you're what some 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 someone watching at what happens from here, uh, what you see is really this. Like whenever they move around each other, if you look from the bottom here, what you see is like them turning around each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, phi is going to be sent to the straight path. So we're going from the configuration where we have a group of like one and two are close to each other on the real line. Yes, there's a question. No way. There's a question on the chat. Friedrich has been asking why only take pi one and not all the opera is nice too. Uh, we're not taking all the pi i. Uh, well, you could do that, but, uh, but uh, the point is that uh, these, uh, these configurations. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I go back to something I, I, I said, before, which was a mistake, but uh, uh -huh. I'm going back to it. Uh, the, the configuration space of points in the plane or, uh, or KT1. So it doesn't matter. I mean, the, there's no higher order. And I realized that I made a, a like I, I switched some step. So I wanted to say that what I did for R, you can do it for R2. And obviously, like you can have right, 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 right. another done in R2 here. That's really important. All right. So now I'm considering the configuration set of points in the plane. And yeah, so I'm sorry about this. Yeah. So we have the configuration space of points in on the line. Well, you can include the line in the plane. So any configuration in R gives you a configuration in R2. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, is this visible? We? Oui. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to, like, it's something that you can show that the, the compactification are somehow consistent with each other and the operating structure as well. And then you have PA, which is inside here. So what we what we do is really we see PA as a sub operand of the configuration space operand on top of the plane. And this PA, we view them as like this maximum parentization, we view them as configuration that lives on the real line on, on the on the horizontal line in, in R2. Okay. Uh, so otherwise there, there, there would be no room for turning around nice. each other here. Yeah. And so that's where R is sent, and this phi, which is this uh, this picture here, it is sent to a straight line that goes from configuration where these two points like collide, and the second point go to the third one going on the real on, on the horizontal line. Okay, so that's the path in, in this uh, group point. Uh, 
Yeah, that's 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 an exercise to check that these the, the relations here are satisfied there. Uh, so that you indeed have a morphism of operating group weights. And uh, but then you have to prove that it's an it's an isomorphism of group of operating group weights. So to do so, you just have to prove that it's an isomorphism in each array. Um, so that's all right. So proving that it's a morphism, it's not something difficult once you know the presentation of PAB by generating a relation. You just check that the relations are satisfied, and that's purely like drawings. Uh, proving it's an isomorphism, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, so first of all, let me observe several things. So both group weights. Are connected. What does connected means? It means that like any two elements, any two objects of the group weights are related by an arrow. So like yeah, I should say in each array, okay, so um, it's just that uh, like there's there are no no like you can never find two objects in your group weight which are not related by an arrow. Okay, so that's a that's one very nice property. Uh, the map that we have here is the identity of objects. So It is sufficient to prove that uh, for an arbitrary, by this I mean you can pick one and just one uh, object. Uh, for instance, I'm going to choose like. The less most parenthesization of the one to n. Uh, the morphism induces an isomorphism on the automorphism group. Why is it sufficient? Because we know that all automorphism groups and all isomorphism between any two objects are isomorphic, non-canonically, but anytime you pick an element between them, you get an isomorphism. So if you prove that for one element, the automorphism group is isomorphic to that automorphism group uh, via this, uh, this, this morphism, then you get that you get an isomorphism of group weights. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's do this. So on one side, we have the automorphism group in P, A, B, N. Of like one, two, three, etc. Up to that. Uh, this is the pure rate on n strands, uh, and uh, I I recall you that this group is generated by the elementary pure, pure rate x i j that I described before. These things where i goes around j comes back, right? Um, <clears throat> let me give a name to this of right here. Just temporarily, let me call it O. Okay. 
<laughs> very creative. Yeah, very creative. I agree. <laughs> I'm proud of this. Uh, so the Oromax group of the, the very same elements in uh, M. That's the fundamental group of the configuration, the, the compactified configuration space uh, at these base points. So first of all, th there's two things to know here. First of all, when you compactify the configuration space, it doesn't change the homotopy type. So the fundamental group remains the same. That's one thing. And second of all, uh, I mean, that's, that's true for every space. You can move a bit the, the base points. You get an isomorphic fundamental group, right? So this is isomorphic to the fundamental group of the open configuration space based on the points. Let me write it uh, uh, like this. So we, we're going to have like one, two, and so we just like, uh, I mean, before, I mean, one and two were colliding together, and three was colliding to this group, etc. We just like uh, put some space between these points so that they belong to the open configuration space. All right, and now uh, if you trace by where, so where the x i j are sent inside here, it's Fairly easy to see. So xij is sent to the following path. Okay. Again, if you look from below here, what you do is really have like and you and you do the movie of what the moving points. What you see is that you have the i strand going uh, like under crossing everyone, going around j and then crossing everyone back. So that's exactly what we like what we we showed to the x i j. And then um, so that's 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 the, the map we get. And then that, that's a standard resulting topology that's the map you get from PDN to this one little group is indeed an isomorphism. I don't know who to attribute this result to, but that's a, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry? Martin. Martin. Okay. Thank you very much. You have a question on the chat? Yes. If you're, I, I, if you're calling commuting and associativity operation isomorphic, then what happens when the operator are not? I don't, I, I don't think I understand the question. I don't understand the question. Can you make the question more precise? We do not get what, it. What does it mean commuting an RCVD operation being isomorphic? Well. well, let's move forward. If he, if he writes more, I'll, I'll let you okay. know. All right, so uh, how much time? I'm, am I just done or? No, you can count the no, no, no. You, you should have five more minutes, but if you can have five more, 10 more, 15 more. Maybe. Okay. Maybe, maybe 10, maybe. 10, okay. Maybe. Then, then yes. It's not clear to me that, so you have given the map and you have proved that map is an isomorphism in the group voids. Yeah. I mean, in RDF. Yeah. Where did you prove that it's not a Oh no no like yeah what because because PAB as an operand in group ways having PA as an operand of objects is generated by R and phi yeah. having or like, satisfying some relation. Yeah. So so that that's the problem, the relation. You you have to prove that yes, so that's what I said. So to to, to, to give a morphism of operand in group ways there, you just need to specify the image of R and the image of phi, and check that the relations are satisfied. So what I, what I didn't write, but I think I said it, is that checking that the relations are satisfied, it's just drawing pictures in the configuration space. It's, it's fairly easy to, to see that uh, like this braiding is like, 
so the typically the pentagon equation it really becomes the topological pentagon there so it's just uh so like the pentagon relation where will it be sent it will be sent exactly in the in the such a like in the in the in the pentagon it will be sent to the loop that goes around the boundary and that's a contractible loop so the relation will be satisfied uh and for the hexagon uh you will have this i mean up to the up to the to the associator what you will have is just that the braid it's just the young boxer equation or the braid relation like when you braid one two and two three so yeah so but, but there is something to satisfy to work to check i agree but what i'm saying is that it's a it's a, it's a fairly simple exercise in like in topology too yes uh, what is the uh i don't know um yeah it, it might be in the benoit first book uh I, I don't know if it's stated that way i think it's a kind of uh common folklore <laughs> i would say so but i really i want to insist that once you know the, the difficult part is like there's two things which are difficult in historic proving the general relation presentation for cb that's the first thing which is difficult and the second thing is Artin theorem, which which says that's the like the algebraic and the topological definition of the braid group or of the pure group are the same. But once you know this, you just I mean you just apply the machinery. Um, but but I guess this statement in some form is should be in uh, in the book of the office. Yeah. Yeah. Amulia made the question more precise. When the operations are committing. And as well, she did. There is an isomorphic operation. I'm sorry, I agree with all my suggestions. I mean, neither. Maybe you can send an email to Damien. He'll do his yeah. best to answer. Let's, let's and if not, I'll kick his ass. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll spend the last, let's say, five minutes uh, to give some motivation for tomorrow's lecture. Uh, and for why moving to to cyclotomic associators So I wanted to give some motivation, which uh, which has nothing to do with operas for why looking at this uh, fancy object, which are called simple simple atomic associators. Uh, so that one of the first motivation is the following. So uh, there is a version of the deformation problem that I talked about in the introductory reports yesterday, um, which involves now uh, some Lie algebra. And uh, if you have a Lie algebra which comes with a with an automorphism, let's say of order n, um, you can look at the subalgebra of fixed points of this automorphism. And there are, I mean, there, there are a lot of concrete examples, like in Lie theory, of such gadgets. Like typically, if you have like like if n equals two, uh, the whole uh, theory of symmetric pairs uh, uh, gets a lot of interest for people in Lie theory. Um, right. So what you want then is probably like you, you're going to have a, a decomposition of H of G into like two subspaces. Uh, but a, a decomposition which is like H in brains. And then uh, you can ask for the 
deforming the pair representations of UG semi-direct products with uh, Z over NZ, where Z over NZ, like the generator of the cyclic group, acts by the, this automorphism. Uh, and UH. So let, let me explain. So as uh, rated monadal category acting on a rated module category. So uh, UG semi-direct product with Z over NZ. Uh, that is a half algebra, which is co-commutative. So it's representation category. It's a symmetric manual category. Okay. Um, so let's call this C. Let's call this M. So C is symmetric manual. And uh, as we have seen in the in the in the in yesterday, so any T, which is a, uh, a symmetric tensor which is invariant, gives a first order deformation as a as a braid model category. Is a graded C module category. Uh, that's a notion that I think is due to a And uh, so I'm not, what, because this is motivation, I'm not going to give the axioms. Actually, later on, we'll have like some operatic thing. And uh, these graded model category are just representation of this. Um, so in, in a braided model category, you need to like to have an action. So you need to be able to tensor an object of C with an object of M to get an object of M. And then there's this, this uh, additional braiding. So first of all, the action is as follows. Uh, anytime you have a representation of UG symmetric with Z over NZ, you can restrict it as a U H representation because H sits inside this. And then you tensor product this. So you have a UG semi-direct product, whatever representation. You restrict it to H and you tensor it with an, a representation of H and that gives you a representation of H. So that's the action. And then there's this braided module, which means that uh, any times you have an element of C and you tensor it with an element of M, you want um, uh, a natural transformation of this functor here. So you want to be able to act in a natural way on, on the action, just like the braiding act on the tensor product. And here, in this case, in this example, the action is just given by identity tensor the action by uh, the automorphism sigma. OK? So that's the, that's the braiding in this case. And one can prove that if T decomposes well as uh, an H part and an M part, so where TH lives in C2 of H, H invariants, and TM lives in C2 of M, H invariants, then we get a first order deformation of this braided module, module structure. And there's a, there's a, 
there's a whole story where you try to find such deformations. And uh, so I, I, I won't give the details, but uh, you can then rephrase the deformation problem by asking to have universal formula, exactly what, what, like we did in the, in the introduction. And this leads you uh, to the cyclotomic associators. So this, the universal version, which is completely independent of G and H, uh, uh, leads you to the cyclotomic associators. So that's one first motivation. Um, and there's a second motivation, uh, and I'm, I'm going to end with this, which is which comes from number theory, and that's that's a that's an aspect of the story that I've completely ignored in these lectures, but I think it's worth just mentioning it. So there's yeah, there's lots of interesting uh, things with. The relation between associators and number theory. Yeah, maybe someone else will talk a bit more about this. I don't know. Um, like, long story short, um, there's an injection. Of the absolute girl group inside uh, the profinite version of GT. And uh, like, so that's one first thing. And moreover, uh, so the, the, as I told you, in the, in the proof by Greenfield uh, of the existence of associators, like, the, like the, the, the proof involves some. Differential equation that you have to integrate, and so there's a, it gives you a specific uh, associator which is called the basic normal associator, and this associator, just by the way it's defined, it's a generating series for a very interesting numbers which are called multiple data values. For, uh, you can write m's and b's for multiple zeta values, and these multiple zeta values are values of multiple quantity logarithm, which are some very interesting special functions uh, at essentially zeros and ones. So these are like functions of several variables, and you can evaluate them where the variables can be either zero and one. And this gives you the, the these multiple zeta values. All right. And one of the motivations for Benjamin Lake is to introduce uh, these cyclotomic associators was first of all, like he, he, he got like he originally he was motivated by some quantum group stuff, uh, so for motivation A, but then he noticed that uh, you can actually use these cyclotomic associators to get some uh, so the idea was to get some variation. Of the gross dictionary group that would contain uh, the Gala group, uh, not of Q, but of cyclotomic extensions of Q, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that was one motivation. And moreover, in his proof of the existence of associator uh, of, of cyclotomic associators, he used some like some variation of the kinetic number equation, which is called the trigonometric kinetic number equation. And when you integrate it, what you get, I mean, so the, the, the cyclotomic is associator. It appears to be a generating series for uh, values of multiple polylog at zero and roots of unity. And uh, yeah, so that's that's sometimes called colored multiple zeta values. So I should say that like all all the story of cyclotomic associators uh, that's uh, work and probably if you want a reference uh the, the proof that's 
the KCS server is a generic theory for multiple data values that's uh, resultantly and more than. So uh, the aim of today's talk is to explain the the full story of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was <laughs> following. Uh, it's explaining the whole story of cyclotomic acid series using the uh, using operating approach uh, and trying to avoid using formulas. But if you if you look at an IKS paper, that's a, that's really impressive. Like how to get the formula because they are like super complicated. And uh, the nice thing with operators is that like you get a formula as a as a byproduct of the abstract definition. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions? So, uh, for those who are online, you can type them, please. So the, the question is like if the operating approach really gives like new information about this this kind of whole story. I think for yeah I don't know for the part of the story that I've told you I don't think so. There's something I didn't mention but uh, uh, now that you have a like a, an operating group voice which which you could actually do as a topological operator like the nerve. Or, uh, you could also look at the homotopy automorphism of this. And uh, it turns out to be still again equivalent to, to GT. So now if you take, essentially, I mean, the, like the, the idea is that if you take homotopy automorphism of, of KV, which are not necessarily the identity on objects, I think, uh, I think this is um, like, like at least on the level of Pythagorean, you can deform any automorphism to one which is uh, the identity on objects. And uh, so, like that's that's some roughly a way to prove that I think that's in, in one of the first paper uh, to prove that the homotopy automorphism of PV is actually the same thing as the straight automorphism of PV, which are the identity on objects. So it's again GT. And that's how you connect, like now with this, you can connect very easily this story to the linear list of rights and like all these results about the forms of the linear list of rights. So, uh, like for the strict theory of associators, it gives you a new like light on it, but I don't think it led to really new results, I would say, uh, about associate, associators themselves. But I think for all the connection that this topic has to like with several other topics, it is really useful. You have a question online. Do we have any idea of the order of the GT group as the Galois completion group is already very large? Oh, uh, yeah, so the, the, like the question is about the size of the GT group. So there's a, like for the pre nipotent version, there's a conjecture, uh, which is that it's a free group generated by elements in, uh, like by infinite number of elements. So this GT group has like comes equipped with some, some weight and these elements lives in like weights, in all the weights, like three, five, uh, etc. So it's a, it's a pretty big group. And conjecturally, it's the same thing as the, as the, um, the Gala group for uh, some unramified mixed state conditions. Which we know it's a free, it is a free one. But uh, so there's like the at least from the pre nipotent version, there's a there's an expectation for what it looks like, and it's expected to be free. Hmm. And I think uh, there's a reason for Francis Brown that shows that it contains a free it, it contains the free group I was mentioning, but it's it's not proven that there's only this. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes, go ahead. So you said that in the problem with the completion, one can define uh, x to the theta or theta in, in the ground field. Yeah. So how, how is that done? Uh, 
Yeah, so if, if you pick, the, so like, yeah, so the question is how you define x to some yeah. lambda, that's right? In, in the gradient of the completion. So, uh, okay, let me just. So the, the um, in the primitive completion, among, so you have if you start with a with a group G, and you look at this primitive completion, there's a map from G to this, and essentially um, it's in G to And I, I'm, I'm sorry for, for this, but it's in G2 exponential of log of G. And <laughs> like the point I want to make is that log of G exists. So log of G makes sense in the completion of the group algebra. Why is it so? Because uh, like if you, um, because G minus one, it's something that lives in the kernel of the augmentation. Because the augmentation is just in any element of the group to one. So what you do is you write the series log of G, you write this as log of one plus G minus one, that's pretty formal. But that's in the augmentation ideal, so the series makes sense. So as a series in here, this guy makes sense, and that's Essentially, how you define the the you embed G into its pre present completion. But now you can very well write exponential of lambda log of G. That makes perfect sense in here. But that's G to the lambda, right? Thank you. Any other question? <laughs> Let me go ahead. No, no sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, we that the the P1 of the configuration space is the, the, the PR of the map. And uh, what about, uh, if you consider a, a higher dimensional configuration space, is there a non common result? Um, yeah, not that I know. So the, the question is about like a higher dimensional version of the of the configuration space. Um, first of all, I don't think you're K by one anymore. So, like taking pi one does not exhaust the whole homotopy type of these spaces, and I am not aware of like nice description like which are which is similar to to this story. Like nice like I write description of of uh, of the like operator configuration uh, in higher dimension. I think you are spin free connectivity. But... Yeah. So they, they, like even taking pi one doesn't like. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't give anything interesting. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned, for instance, like the Breton uh, integer group, you can view it as a, some series on two variables satisfying some equations. Is there any way to uh, say, okay, this to exhibit a series that satisfies the equation? Like to give an example of it? Or? Uh, the, the question is to give an example of uh, something that lives, some, yeah. an example of something in the Gretzian interpretation yeah. Um I, yeah, I think the, the yeah, I don't know, uh, it may not be easy. The, the easiest thing is the, on the graded Gretzian group side, mm -hmm. uh, because like the, the, the equation you have to satisfy is our linearized somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, and in this case, it's even easier to find well, you get a pre independent group, so it's even better to, to look at the annulling Lie algebra and to find elements in the Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. And actually, Drinfeld exhibited a number of elements. Uh, like, again, that's this element in, the, in, in wave three, five, in all waves. Mm -hmm. And he, like, he conjectured that this generates the. Uh, uh, the the containation of the, the graded containation of the algebra. So, but it's 
there's, there's, a, there's a tutorial where uh, using graph context as you can see these elements quite uh, Yes, yeah, so there's also a picture on a way to describe them uh, using graph complexes, but then you have to explain how you read <laughs> graph complexes yeah, just, with a uh, with yeah. modern technology. So, um, and you're tired, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that part of the story. I don't know very well. So. No, I think we're good. No, any more question? Nobody online anyway. Like, thanks, Damien, again.